Spiritual Progress, Part 2 15. As to a method in prayer, each one must be guided by his own experience. Those who find themselves profited in using a strict method need not depart from it, while those who cannot so confine themselves, they may make use of their own mode, without seeking to re respect that which has been useful to many, and which so many pious and experienced persons have highly recommended. A method is intended to assist. If it be found to embarrass, instead of assisting, the sooner it is discarded, the better. The most natural mode, at first, is to take a book and to cease reading whenever we feel so inclined by the passage on which we were engaged, and, whenever that no longer ministers to our interior nourishment, we begin again. As a general rule, those truths which we highly relish, and which shed a degree of practical light upon the things which are required to give up for God, are leadings of divine grace, which we should follow without hesitation. The Spirit bloweth where it listeth, John 3, 8. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians three seventeen. In the course of time, the proportion of reflections and reasonings will diminish, and that of tender feelings, affecting views and desires, will increase as we become sufficiently instructed and convinced by the Holy Spirit. The heart is satisfied, nourished, warmed, set on fire. A word only will give it employment for a long time. 17. Finally, increase of prayer is indicated by the increase of simplicity and steadiness in our view. A great multitude of objects and considerations being no longer necessary. Our intercourse with God resembles that with a friend. At first there are a thousand things to be told, as many to be asked. But after a time these diminish, while the pleasure of being together does not. Everything has been said, but the satisfaction of seeing each other, a feeling that one is near the other, or reposing in the enjoyment of a pure and sweet friendship, can be felt without conversation. The silence is eloquent and mutually understood. Each feel that the other is in perfect sympathy with him, and that their two hearts were incessantly poured one into the other, and constitute but one. 18. Thus it is that in prayer our communion with God becomes a simpler and familiar union, far beyond the needs of words, let it be remembered that God himself must alone institute this prayer within us. Nothing would be more rash or more dangerous than to dare to attempt it of ourselves. We must suffer ourselves to be led step by step by someone conversant with the ways of God, who may lay the immovable foundation of correct teaching and of the complete death of self in everything. 19. As regards retirement and attending upon ordinances, it must be governed by the advice of someone in whom we have confidence. Our own necessities, the effect produced upon us, and many other circumstances are to be taken into the consideration. 20. Our leisure and our needs must regulate our retirements. Our needs, because it is with the soul as with the body, when we can no longer work without nourishment, we must take it. We shall otherwise be in danger of fainting. Our leisure, because this absolute necessity of food accepted, we must attend to duty before we seek enjoyment in spiritual exercise. 
The man who has public duties and spends the time appropriate to them in meditating with in retirement would miss of God while he was seeking to be united to him. True union with God is to do his will without ceasing, in spite of our natural inclinations in every duty of life, however disagreeable and mortifying. 21. As precautions against wanderings, we must avoid close and intimate intercourse with those who are not pious, especially when we have before led astray by their infectious maxims. They will open our wounds afresh. They have a secret correspondence deep in the souls. There is a soft and insinuating counselor who is always ready to blind and deceive us. 22. Would you judge of a man? says the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 13.20 Observe who are his companions. How can he who loves God, who loves nothing except in and for God, enjoy the intimate companionship of those who neither love nor know God, and who look upon love to him as a weakness? Can a heart full of God and sensible of his own frailty ever rest and be at ease with those who have no feeling in common with it, but are ever seeking to rob it of treasure? Their delights and the pleasures which faith is the source are incompatible. 23. I am well aware that we cannot nay, that we ought not to break with those friends, to whom we are bound by esteem of their natural amiability, by their services, by the tie of sincere friendship, or by the regard consequent upon mutual good offices. Friends whom we have treated with a certain familiarity and confidence would be wounded to the quick, were we to separate them entirely but we must gently and imperceptibly diminish our intercourse with them, without abruptly declaring our alteration of sentiment. We may see them in private, distinguish them from our less intimate friends, and confide to them those matters which their integrity and friendship enable them to give us good advice, and to think with us, although our reason for so thinking are more pure and elevated than theirs. In short, we may continue to serve them, and to manifest all the attentions of a cordial friendship, without suffering our hearts to be embarrassed by them. 24. How perilous is our state without this precaution! If we do not, from the first, boldly adopt all measures to render our piety entirely free and independent of our unregenerate friends, it is threatened with a speedy downfall. If a man surrounded by such companions be of a yielding disposition and inflammable passion, it is certain that his friends, even the best-intentioned ones, will lead him astray. They may be good honest, faithful, and possessed of all those qualities which render friendship perfect in the eye of the world, but for him they are infected, and their amiability only increases the danger. Those who have not this estimable character should be sacrificed at once. Blessed are we when a sacrifice that ought to cost us so little may avail to give us so precious a security for our eternal salvation. 25. Not only then should we exceedingly careful from whom we will see, but we must also reserve the necessary time that we may see God alone in prayer. Those who have stations of importance to fill, have generally so many indispensable duties to perform, and without the greatest care in the management of their time, none will be left to be alone with God. If they have ever so little inclination for dissipation, the hours that belong to God and their neighbor disappear altogether. 
We must be firm in observing our rules. The strictness seems excessive, but without it everyone falls into confusion. We become dissipated, relaxed, and lose strength. We insensibly separate from God, surrender ourselves to all our pleasures, and only then begin to perceive that we have wandered, when it is almost hopeless to think of endeavoring to return. Prayer, prayer, this is our only safety. Blessed be God which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Psalms 116.20 And to be faithful in prayer, it is indispensable that we should dispose of all employments of the day, which a regularity nothing can disturb. 5. On conformity to the life of Jesus Christ. We must imitate Jesus, live as he lived, think as though he thought, and be conformed to his image, which is the seal of our sanctification. What a contrast! Nothing strives to be something, and the omnipotent becomes nothing. I will be nothing with thee, my Lord. I offer thee the pride and vanity which have possessed me hitherto. Help thou my will. Remove me from occasions of my stumbling. Turn away mine eyes from beholding a vanity. Let me behold nothing but thee and myself in thy presence, that I may understand what I am and what thou art. Jesus Christ was born in a stable. He was obliged to fly into Egypt. Thirty years of his life were spent in a workshop. He suffered hunger, thirst, weariness. He was poor, despised, and miserable. He taught the doctrines of heaven, and no one would listen. The great and the wise persecuted and took him, subjected him to frightful torments, treating him as a slave and put him to death between two malefactors, having preferred to give liber liberty to a robber rather than to suffer him to escape. Such was the life which our Lord chose. And while we are horrified at any humiliation, we cannot bear the slightest appearance of contempt. Let us compare our lives with that of Jesus Christ reflecting that he was the master and that we are his servants and he was all-powerful and that we are but weakness that he was abased and that we are exalted let us so constantly bear our wretchedness in mind that we may have nothing but contempt for ourselves with what face can we despise others and dwell upon their faults and when we ourselves are filled with nothing else, let us begin to walk the path of our Saviour has marked out, if only for the only one that can lead us to him. How can we expect to find Jesus if we do not seek him in the states of his earthly life, loneliness and silence, in poverty and suffering, in persecution and contempt, in annihilation and the cross? The saints find him in heaven, and the splendors of glory and in unspeakable pleasures, but it is only after having dwelt with him on earth in reproaches, in pain and in humiliation. To be a Christian is to be an imitator of Jesus Christ. In what can we imitate him if not in his humiliation? Nothing else can bring us near to him. We may adore him as omnipotent, fear him as just, love him with all our heart as good and merciful, but we can only imitate him as humble, submissive, poor, and despised. Let us not imagine that we can do this by our own efforts. Everything that is written is opposed to it, but we may rejoice in the presence of God. Jesus was chosen to be made partaker of all our weaknesses. He is a compassionate high priest who has voluntarily submitted to be tempted on all points just as we are. Let us, then, 
have all our strength in him who became weak so that he might strengthen us. Let us enrich ourselves out of his poverty, confidently exclaiming, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Philippians 4.13 Let me follow in thy footsteps, O Jesus. I would imitate thee, but I cannot without the aid of thy grace. O humble and lowly Saviour, grant me the knowledge of the true Christian, and that I may willingly despise myself. Let me learn the lesson, too com incomprehensible to the mind of man, that I must die to myself by an abandonment of all that shall produce true humility. Let us earnestly engage in this work, and change this hard heart, so rebellious to the heart of Jesus Christ. Let us make some approaches towards the holy soul of Jesus. Let him animate our souls and destroy all our repugnances. O lovely Jesus, who hast suffered so many injuries and reproaches for my sake, let me esteem and love them for thine, and let me desire to share thy life of humiliation. 6. On Humility What a mercy is humiliation to a soul that receives it with, with a steadfast faith! There are a thousand blessings in it for ourselves and for others, for our Lord bestows his grace upon the humble. Humility renders us charitable towards our neighbor. Nothing will make us so tender and indulgent to the faults of others as a view of our own. Two things produce humility when combined. The first is a sight of the abyss of wretchedness from which all powerful hand of God has snatched us, over which he still holds us, as it were, suspect, suspended in the air, and the other is the presence of that God who is all. Our faults, even the most difficult to bear, in all be of service to us if we make use of them in our humiliation without relaxing our efforts to correct them. It does no good to be discouraged. It is the result of a disappointed and despairing self-love. The true method of profiting by the humiliation of our faults is to behold them in all their deformity, without losing our hope in God, and without having any confidence in ourselves. We must bear with ourselves, either without either flattery or discouragement, a mean seldom attained, for we either expect great things for ourselves and our good intentions, or wholly despair. We must hope nothing for self, but wait for everything from God, utter despair of ourselves. It consequence of our convictions of our helplessness and unbounded confidence in God are the true foundations of the public edifice. That is a false humility, which, acknowledging itself unworthy of the gifts of God, dares not confidently expect them. True humility consists in a deep view of our utter unworthiness and in an absolute abandonment to God, without the slightest doubt that he will do the greatest things in us. Those who are truly humble will be surprised to hear anything exalted of themselves. They are mild and peaceful, of a contrite and humble heart, merciful and compassionate. They are quiet cheerful, obedient, watchful, fervent in spirit, and incapable of strife. They always take the lowest place, rejoice when they are despised, and consider every one superior to themselves. They are lenient to their faults of others in view of their own, and very far from preferring themselves before anyone. We may judge of our advancement in humility 
by the delight we have in humiliations and contempt. 7. On Prayer Many are tempted to believe that they no longer pray, when they cease to enjoy a certain pleasure in the act of prayer. But if they will reflect that perfect prayer is only another name for the love of God, they will be undeceived. Prayer, then, does not consist in sweet feelings, nor in the charms of an exciting imagination, nor in that humiliation of intellect that traces with ease the sublimest truths in God, nor even in a certain consolation in the view of God. All these things are external gifts from His hand, in the absence of which love may exist even more purely, as the soul may then attach itself immediately and solely to God, instead of to his mercies. This is what love by naked faith, which is the death of nature, because it leaves it no support. And when we are convinced that all is lost, that very conviction is the evidence at all is gained. Pure love is in the will alone. It is no sentimental love, for the imagination has no part in it, it loves, if we may so express it, without feeling, as faith believes without seeing. We need not fear that this love is an imaginary thing. Nothing can be less so than mere will separate from all imagination, or more purely intellectual and spiritual are the operations of our minds, the nearer they are, not only to reality but to the perfection which God requires to us. Their working is more perfect. Faith is in full exercise while humility is preserved. Such love is chaste, for it is the love of God, in and for God. We are attached to Him, but not for the pleasure which He bestows on us. We follow Him, but not for the loaves and fishes. What, some may say, can it be that a simple will be united with God? is the whole of pity. How can we be assured that this will is not a mere idea, a trick of the imagination, instead of a true willing of the soul? I should indeed believe that it was a deception, if we were not the parent of faithfulness on all proper occasions, for a good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and a true will makes us truly earnest and diligent in doing the will of God but it is still compatible with this life in little failings which are permitted by God, and that the soul may be humbled. If, then, we experience only these little daily frailties, let us not be discouraged, but extract them from their fr proper fruit, humility. True virtue and pure love reside in the will alone. It is not a great matter always to desire the supreme good whenever he is seen, to keep the mind steadily turned towards him, and to bring it back whenever it is perceived to wander, to will nothing advisedly but according to his order. In short, in the absence of all sensible enjoyment, still to remain the same in the spirit of submissive, irreclaimable burnt offering, do you think it is nothing to repress all the easy reflections of self-love, to press forward continually, without knowing whither we go, and yet without stopping, to cease from self-satisfied thoughts of self, or at least to think of others as we would of another, to fulfill the indications of providence for the moment and no further? It is not this more likely to be the death of an old Adam than fine sentiments, in which we are, in fact, thinking only of self or external acts, in the performance of which we congratulate self on the advance. It is a sort of infidelity to simple faith when we desire to be continually assured that we are doing well. It is, in fact, the desire to know what we are doing, which we shall never know. 
and of which it is the will of God that we should be ignorant. It is trifling by the way in order to reason about the way. The safest and shortest course is to renounce, forget, and abandon self, and through faithfulness to God to think no more of it. This is the whole of religion, to get out of self and of self-love in order to get into God. As to involuntary wanderings, there are no hindrance to love, inasmuch as love is in the will, and the will only wanders when it wills to wander. As soon as we perceive that they have occurred, we drop them instantly and return to God. Thus, while the external senses of the spouse are asleep, the heart is watching. Its love knows no intermission. A tender parent does not always bear his son distinctly in mind. He thinks and imagines a thousand things disconnected with him, but they do not interfere with the paternal affection. The moment that his thoughts rest again upon his child, he loves and feels in the depths of his soul that though he has ceased to think of him, he has not, been, not for an instant failed to love him. Such should be our love to our Heavenly Father, a love simple, trustful, confident, and without anxiety. If our imagination take wing and our thoughts wander, let us not be perplexed. All these things are not that hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even uh, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, of which St. Peter speaks. 1 Peter 3, 4 let us only turn our thoughts, whenever we can, towards the face of the well-beloved, without being troubled at our wanderings. When shall he see fit to enable us to preserve a more constant sense of his presence with us? He will do so. He sometimes removes it for our advancement. It amuses us with too many reflections, which are true distractions, diverting the mind from a simple and direct look towards God and withdrawing us from the shades of naked faith. We often seek in these reflections a resting place for our self-love and consolation in the testimony we endeavor to extract from them for self, and thus the warmth of our feelings causes us to wander. On the contrary, we never pray so purely as when we are tempted to believe that we do not pray at all. We fear that we pray ill, but we should only fear being left to the desolation of sinful nature, to a philosophical infidelity, seeking perpetually a demonstration of its own operations in faith, in, in short, to impatient desires for consolation in sight and feeling. There is no more bitter penance than this state of pure faith, without sensible support, and hence it seems to me the most effective, the most crucifying, and the least elusive. Strange temptation! We look impatiently for a sensible consolation from the fear of not being penitent enough. Ah, why do we not consider the renouncement of that consolation which we are so strongly tempted to seek as a proof of our penitence? Remember our Lord abandoned by his Father on the cross, all feeling, all reflection, all withdrawn that his God might be hidden from him, this was indeed the last blow that fell upon the man of sorrows, the consummation of the sacrifice. Never should we so abandon ourselves to God as when he seems to abandon us. Let us enjoy light and consolation, and when it is his pleasure to give it to us. But let us not attach ourselves to his gifts, but to him, and when he plunges us into the night of pure faith, let us still press on through the agonizing darkness. 
Moments are worth days in this tribulation. The soul is troubled and yet at peace. Not only is God hidden from it, but it is hidden from itself, that all may be of faith. It is discouraged, but feels nevertheless an immovable will to bear all that God may choose to inflict. It, it wills all, accepts all, even in the troubles that try its faith, and thus in the very height of the tempest, the waters beneath are secretly calm and at peace, because its will is one with God's. Blessed be the Lord who performeth such great things in us, notwithstanding our unworthiness. 8. On Meditation When the solid foundations of a perfect conversion of heart, a scrupulous repentance and a serious meditation of all the Christian virtues that have been laid, both theoretically and practically, we become gradually so accustomed to these truths that we regard them as at last with a simple and steady look, without the necessity of going back to examine and convince ourselves of each of them in detail. They are then all embraced in a certain enjoyment of God, so pure and so intimate, that we find everything in Him. It is no longer the intellect that examines and reasons, it is the will which loves and plunges into the infinite good. But this is not your state. You must walk for a long while in the way of sinners who are beginning to seek God. Ordinary meditation is your lot, too happy that God condescends to admit you to it. Walk, then, in the Spirit, like Abraham, without knowing whither you go. Be content with your daily bread, and remember that in the desert the manna of today could not be preserved until tomorrow without corrupting. The children of God must be shut up to the grace of the present moment, without desiring to foresee the designs of providence concerning them. Meditate, then, since now is your opportunity upon all the mysteries of Jesus Christ, and upon all the gospel truths which you have had for so long a time ignored and rejected. When God shall have entirely effaced from your mind the impression of all your worldly maxims, and the Spirit shall have left there no trace of your old prejudices, then it will be necessary to ascertain the direction of which you are attracted by grace, and to follow step by step without anticipating. In the meantime, dwell in peace in the bosom of God, like a little child on the breast of its mother. Be satisfied with thinking on your chosen subject simply and easily. Suffer yourself to be led gently to the truths which affect you, in which you find to nourish your heart. Avoid all exertions that excite the intellect, which often tempt us to believe that there is more piety in a dangerous vivacity of the imagination than in a pure and upright intention of abandonment to God. Avoid likewise all refined speculation, Confine yourself to simple reflection, and recur to them frequently. Those who pass too rapidly from one truth to another feed their curiosity and restlessness. Even they distract their intell intellect by too great a multiplicity of views. Give every truth time to send down deep roots into the heart. The main point is to love. Nothing gives rise to such severe fits of indigestion as eating too much and too hastily. Digest every truth leisurely. If you could extract the essence of it for your nourishment, 
but let there be no restless self-reflective acts. Be sure that you exercise your will, not be acceptable unless performed without agitation or tumult. I am well aware that you will have distractions enough. Bear them without impatience. Dismiss them and recur quietly to your subject as soon as you perceive that your imagination has wandered. In this way, these voluntary distractions will produce no injurious effects, and the patience with which you bear them without being discouraged will advance you further than the more continuous meditation in which you might take more self-satisfaction. The true method of, of conquering wandering thoughts is never to attack them directly with bitterness and never to be discouraged by their frequency or duration. Suffer yourself, then, to be quietly occupied by the subject you have chosen. Let, only let the exercise be as holy as you can make it, to which end takes the following directions. Do not encumber yourself with a great number of thoughts upon your subject, but dwell upon each sufficiency long to allow it to afford its proper nourishment to the heart. You will gradually become accustomed to regard each truth steadily by yourself, without flitting from one another. This habit will serve to fix them deeply in your soul. Thus you will also acquire a habit of dwelling upon your themes of pleasure and peaceful acquiescence instead of considering them rapidly and intellectually as most people do. Thus the foundations will be firmly laid for all that God intends to do in you. He will thus mortify the natural activity of the mind that ever in inclines it to seek novelties instead of deeply imprinting the truths already in some degree familiar. You must not, however, forcibly restrain your mind to a subject which no longer seems to afford any nourishment. I would advise only that you should not abandon it so long as it still ministers food. As to your affections, retain all which the subject of yours view naturally and quietly induces, but do not attempt to stir yourself up to greater efforts, for they will exhaust and agitate you, and even cause aridities. They will occupy you much with your own exertions, and implant a dangerous confidence in your own power. In short, they will attach you too firmly to sensual pleasures, and will thus prepare you great trouble in a time of dryness. Be content, then, to follow with simplicity and without too many reflections the emotions which God shall excite in a view of your subject or of any other truth. As for higher things, have no thoughts of them. There is a time for everything, and it is of the greatest importance that nothing should be precipitated. One of the cardinal rules of the spiritual life is that we are to live exclusively in the present moment, without casting a look beyond. You remember that the Israelites in the desert followed the pillar of fire, or of cloud, without knowing whither it is leading them. They had a supply of manna, but for one day. Above all, that became useless. There is no necessity now for moving rapidly. Think only of laying a solid foundation. See that it is deep and broad by an absolute renunciation of self, and by abandonment without reserve to the requirements of God. 
Let God, then, raise upon his foundation such a building as he pleases. Shut your eyes and commit yourself to him. How wonderful is this walking with Abraham in pure faith, not knowing whither we go. And how full of blessing is this path. God will then be your guide. He himself will travel with you. As we are told he did with the Israelites to bring them step by step across the desert to the promised land. Ah, what will be your blessedness if you will but surrender yourself into the hands of God, permitting him to do whatever he will, not according to your desires, but according to his own good pleasure. 9. On Mortification God calls us hourly and momentarily in the exercise of mortification, but nothing can be more false than the maxim that we should always choose that which mortifies us the most. Such a plan would soon destroy our health, our reputations, our business, our intercourse with our relatives and friends and the good works which provide providence requires of us. I have no hesitation in saying that we ought to avoid certain things which experience has shown us to injure our health, such as the certain kinds of food, etc. This course will, no doubt, spare us some suffering but it does not tend to pamper the body, nor require the employment of expensive or delicious substitutes. On the contrary, it conduces to a sober, and therefore, in many respects, mortified life. Failures in regimen are owing to a want of mortification. They are not due either to courage in enduring pain, or to indifference to life, but to a weak hankering for pleasure and impatience of anything that annoys. Submitting to regimen for the purpose of preserving health is a great constraint. We would much rather suffer and be sick than be constantly restraining our appetites. We love liberty and pleasure more than health. But God arranges all that in his heart, which is so devoted to him. He causes us to fall in quietly with every regulation, and he takes away a certain want of pliability in the will, and a dangerous confidence in ourselves. He blunts the desires, cools the passions, detaches the man, not only from exterior things, but from self, renders him mild, amiable, simple, lowly, ready to will or not, according to his good pleasure. Let it be so with us. God desires it and is ready to effect it. Let us not resist his will. The mortification which comes in the order of God is more serviceable than any enjoyment in devotion which should result from our own affection and choice. In regards to austerities, everyone must regard his attraction, his state, his need, and his temperament. A simple mortification, consisting in nothing more than an unshakable fidelity to providential crosses, is often far more valuable than severe austerities which render the life more marked and tempt to a vain self-complacency. Whoever will refuse nothing which comes in the order of God and seek nothing out of that order need never fear the finish his day's work without partaking of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
There is an indispensable providence for crosses as well as the necessities of life. They are part of our daily bread. God will never suffer it to fail. It is sometimes very useful mortification to a certain fervent of souls to give up their own plans of mortification and adopt with cheerfulness those which are momentarily revealed in the order of God. When a soul is not faithful in providential mortifications, there is fear, reason to fear, some illusion in those which are sought through the fervor of devotion. Such warmth is often deceitful, and it seems to me that a soul in this case could do well to examine its faithfulness under the da daily crosses allotted by providence. 10. On Self-Abandonment If you would fully comprehend the meaning of self-abandonment, Recall the interior difficulty which you felt, and which you very naturally testified when I directed you always to count as nothing, this self, which is so dear to us. To abandon oneself is to count one's self as not. He who has perceived the difficulty of doing it has already learned what that renunciation is, which so revolts our nature. Since you have felt the blow, it is evident that it has fallen upon a sore spot in your heart. Let the all-powerful hand of God work in you, as he well knows how, to tear you from yourself. The origin of our troubles is that we love ourselves with a blind passion that amounts to idolatry. If we love anything beyond, it is only for our own sakes. We must be undeceived respecting all those generous friendships in which it appears as though we so far forgot ourselves as to think only of the interests of our friends. In the motive of our friendship, be not low and gross. It is nevertheless still selfish and the more delicate. The more concealed and the more proper in the eyes of the world is, more dangerous does it become, and the more likely to poison us by feeding our self-love. In those friendships with which appear, both to ourselves and to the world, so generous and disinterested, we seek, in short, the pleasure of loving without recompense, and by the indulgence of so noble a sentiment of raising ourselves above the weak and sordid of our race, besides the tribute we pay to our own pride, we seek from the world the reputation of disinterestedness and generosity. We desire to be loved by our friends, although we do not desire to be served by them. We hope that they will be charmed with what we do for them, without any expectation of return, and in this way we can get the very return which we seem to despise, for what is more delicious to delicate self-love than to hear itself applauded for not being self-love. You may have seen someone who seems to think of everyone but himself who was the delight of good people, who was well disciplined and seemed entirely forgetful of self. The self-oblivion is so great that self-love even would imitate it, and finds no glory equal in that of seeming to seek none at all. This moderation and the self-renunciation, which, if genuine, would be for the death of nature, become, on the other hand, the most subtle and imperceptible food of a pride which despises all the ordinary glories of glo uh, forms of glory and desires only that which is to be secured by trampling underfoot all the gross objections of ambition which captivate ordinary minds. But it is not a difficult matter to unmask this mild 
arrogance. This pride seems to be no pride at all. So much does it appear to have renounced all the ordinary objects of desire. Condemn it, and it cannot bear to be found fault with. Let him who it, fail, who it loves fail to repay it with friendship, esteem, and confidence, and it is stung to the quick. It is easy to see that it is not disinterested, though it tries so hard to seem so. It does not indeed accept payment as in gross coins of others. It does not desire insipid praise or money or that good fortune which consists in office and dignities. It must be repaid nevertheless. It is greedy of the esteem of good people. It loves that it may be loved again and be admired for its disinterestedness. It seems to forget self, that, by that means, it may draw the attention of the whole world upon self alone. It does not, indeed, make all these reflections in full denial. It does not say so in so many words. I will deceive the whole world with my generosity, in order that the world may love and admire me. No, it would not dare to address such a gross and unworthy language to itself. It deceives itself with the rest of the world. It admires itself in its generosity, as a belle admires her beauty in a mirror. It is affected by perceiving that it is more generous and more disinterested than the rest of mankind. The illusion it prepares for others extends to itself. It passes with itself for what it passes itself upon the others, that is, for generosity, and this is what pleases it more than anything else. However little we may have looked at within to study the occasions of our pleasure and our grief, we shall have no difficulty in admitting that pride, as it is more or less delicate, has various tastes. But give it what you will, it is still pride, and that which appears that most restrained and the most reasonable is the most devilish. In steaming itself it despises others. It pities those who are pleased with foolish vanities. It, see, it recognizes the emptiness of the greatness and rank. It cannot abide those who are intoxicated with good fortune. It would, by its moderation, be above fortune, and thus raise itself to a new height. By putting under foot all the false glory of men. Like Lucifer, it would become like to the Most High. It would be a sort of divinity, above all human passions and interests, but it does not perceive that it seeks to place itself above men by this deceitful pride which blinds it. We may be sure, then, that it is the love of God only that can make us come out of self. It is his powerful hand did not sustain us. We should not know how to take the first step in that direction. There is no middle course. We must refer everything either to God or to self. If to self, we have no other God than self. If to God, we are then in order, regarding ourselves only among the other creatures of God, without selfish interests, and with a single eye to accomplish his will, we enter into that self-abandonment, which you desire so earnestly to understand. But let me say again, that nothing will so shut your heart against the grace of abandonment as that philosophic pride and self-love whose disguise 
of worldly generosity, of which you should be especially in fear on account of your natural disposition towards it, the greatness of our inherent endowments, a frankness, disinterestedness, pleasure in doing good, delicacy of feeling, love of honor, and generous friendship. The more lively should be our distrust of self, and our fear lest we take complacency in the gifts of nature. The reason why no creature can draw us out of ourselves is that there is none that deserves to be preferred before ourselves. There is none which has the right to detach us, nor the perfection which would be necessary to unite to them without reference to ourselves, nor to the power to satisfy the soul such as an attachment. Hence it is that we love nothing out of ourselves, except for the reference it has to self. We chose under the direction of our coarse and brutal passions, and if we are low and boorish, and under the guidance of a refined sense of glory, if we are so delicate as not to be satisfied with what is gross and vulgar, but God does two things, which he has only, only he has the power to do. He reveals himself to us with all his lights over the creature and in all the charms of his goodness. Then we feel that, not having made ourselves, we are not made for ourselves, that we are created for the glory of him whom it has pleased to form us. He is too great to make anything except for himself, and that thus all our perfection and our happiness should be lost in him. This is what no created thing, dazzling though it may be, can make us realize in respect to it, far from finding them in that infinity which so fills and transports us to in God we discover only a void, a powerlessness to fill our hearts, an imperfection that continually drives ourselves. The second miracle which God works is to operate in our hearts that which he pleases. Having enlightened our understanding he is not satisfied with having displayed his own charms. He makes us love him by producing, by his grace, his love in our hearts. And thus himself performs within us and would make us see what we owe him. You desire, perhaps, to know more in detail in what this self-abandonment consists. I will endeavor to satisfy you. There is little difference in comprehending that we must reject criminal pleasures, unjust gains, and gross vanities, because the renouncement of these things consists in a contempt which repudiates them absolutely, and forbids our deriving any enjoyment from them. But it is not so easy to understand that we must abandon property, property honestly acquired, the pleasures of a modest and well-spent life, and the honors derivable from a good reputation and a virtue which elevates us above the reach of envy. The reason why we do not understand that these things must be given up that we are not required to discard them with dislike, but, on the contrary, to preserve them, to be used according to the station in which the divine providence places us. We have need of the consolation of a mild and peaceful life, to console us under its troubles, to respect to honors, 
it must regard that which is convenient. And we must keep the property we possess to supply our wants. How then are we to renounce these things? At the very moment when we are occupied in the care of preserving them, we are moderate and without inordinate emotion to do what is in our power to retain them in order to make a sober use of them without desiring to enjoy them or placing our hearts upon them. I say sober use of them because when we are not attached to a thing for the purpose of self-enjoyment and of seeking our happiness in it we only use so much of it as we are necessarily obliged to. And you may see a wise and faithful steward study to appropriate only so much of his master's property as is precisely requisite to meet his necessary wants. The abandonment of evil things, then, consists in refusing them with horror of good things in using them with moderation with our necessities continually studying to retrench all those imaginary wants with which greedy nature would flatter herself remember that we must not only renounce evil but also good things for jesus has said Whatsoever he be of you that forsaketh not all he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14.33 It follows, then, that the Christian must abandon everything that he has, however innocent, for, if he does not renounce it, it ceases to be innocent. He must abandon those things in which it is his duty to guard with the greatest possible care, such as the good of his family, or of his own reputation, for he must have his heart on none of these things. He must preserve them for a sober and moderate use. In short, he must be ready to give them all up whenever it is the will of providence to deprive him of them. He must give those whom he loves best, and whom was his duty to love. His pronouncement of them consists in this, that he is to love them for God only, to make use of the consolation of their friendship soberly, and for the supply of his wants, to be ready to part with them wherever God wills it, and never to seek them in the true repose of his heart. This is what chastity of true Christian friendship seeks in the mortal and earthly friend, only the heavenly spouse. It is thus that we use the world and the creature as not abusing them according to St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 7.31. We do not desire to take pleasure in them. We only use what God gives us, what he wills that we should love, and that we accept with reserve of heart, receiving it only for necessity's sake, and keeping itself for a more worthy object. God is a jealous God. If, in the recesses of her soul, you are attached to any creature, your heart is not worthy of him. He must reject it as a spouse that divides her he must reject it as a spouse that divides her affections between her bridegroom and a stranger. Having abandoned everything exterior, which is not self, it remains to complete the sacrifice by renouncing everything interior, including self. The renouncement of the body is frightful to most delicate and worldly-minded persons. They know nothing, 
so to speak, that is, more themselves than this body, which they flatter and adore with so much care, even when deprived of its graces, they often retain a love for its life, amounting to a shameful cowardice, so that the very name of death makes them shudder. Your natural courage raises you above these fears, and I think I hear you say, I desire neither to flatter my body nor hesitate in consenting to its destruction, whenever it shall be the will of God to waste and consume it to ashes. Thus you must renounce the body, and yet they may remain great obstacles in the way of your renouncing the spirit. The more we are able, by the aid of our natural courage, to despise the clay tenement, the more apt we are to set a higher value upon that which it contains, by the aid of which we are enabled to look down upon it. We feel towards our understanding, our wisdom, and our virtue, as a young and worldly woman feels towards her beauty. We take pleasure in them. It gives us a satisfaction to feel that we are wise, moderate, and preserved from excitement to w in which others see we are intoxicated. With the pleasure of not being intoxicated with pleasure, we renounce with courageous moderation the most flattering temptation in the world and content us with the satisfaction derived from a conviction of our self-control. What a dangerous state! What a subtle poison! How recreant are you to God! If you yield your heart to this refinement of self-love, you must renounce all satisfaction and all natural complacency in your own wisdom and virtue. Remember, the purer and more excellent the gifts, the more jealous he is of them. He showed mercy to the first human rebel, and denied it to the angels. Both sinned by the love of self, but as the angel was perfect and regarded as a sort of divinity, God punished his unfaithfulness with a fiercer je jealousy than he did man's disobedience. We may infer from this that God is more jealous of his most excellent gifts than he is of a more common ones. He would have us attached to nothing but himself. And to regard his gifts, however excellent, as only the means of uniting us more easily and intimately to him. Whoever contemplates the grace of God with a satisfaction and a sort of pleasure of ownership, turns it into poison. Never appropriate exterior things to yourself, then, such as favor or talents, nor even things that are most interior. Your good will is no less a gift of God's mercy than the life and being which you direct from his hands. Live, as it were, on trust. All that is in you, all that you are, is only loaned you. Make use of it according to the will of him who lends it, but never regard it for a moment as your own. Herein consists true self-abandonment. It is the spirit of self-divesting. This use of ourselves and our and of ours with a single eye to the movements of God, who alone is the true proprietor of his creatures. You will desire to know, probably, what should be the practice of this renouncement in detail, but I answer that the feelings is no s sooner established in the interior of the wall of the soul then God himself will take you by the hand that you may be exercised in self-renunciation in every moment, every event of every day. 
Self-abandonment is not accomplished by means of painful reflections and continual struggles. It is only by refraining from self-contemplation and from the desire to master ourselves in our own way, and that we lose ourselves in God.